Again, my thanks to Robert for bringing us our readings today. We're going to think briefly about both of those readings, but before we do that, um, is it just me? Perhaps it is. Or do you, ever, do you ever feel that you're not good enough for this Christian life? Do you ever feel that you'll never do anything extraordinary for God? Do you ever feel that you're just designed to live an ordinary existence? Just an ordinary person leading an ordinary life, nothing fancy. I must admit I do feel like that most of the time. Let me tell you something before we get started, before we get into the, uh, the word. First, uh, Paul's first letter, or sorry, Peter's first letter, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 says we are to be very careful. He says, be careful, watch out for the attacks of the devil, because he is your great enemy. He prowls about like a roaring lion looking for a victim to devour. Just before we, we think about this whole idea of living an ordinary life rather than an extraordinary life and hopefully wanting to live an extraordinary life for God, it doesn't do us any harm to just remember that whenever we become a Christian, we enter into this battle uh, and the devil wants to trip us up. In fact, there's three things the devil wants to do. He wants to steal our joy. He wants to steal our, the joy of knowing that we have a beautiful Savior. He wants, us, he wants to make us the most miserable, miserable person we can be. And I don't mean just with this. He wants to steal our joy. But the Bible says the joy of the Lord should be our strength. But Satan wants us to lose sight of that. Satan wants to kill our witness. He wants to make us ineffective for God. So you're a Christian and you want to live for God, but very often you're afraid, you're scared. For example, you think, what am I going to do if someone asks me about my faith? What am I going to do if, if someone asks me about Jesus? What will I say? You think to yourself, I, I don't know the Bible well enough. Well, I don't have a strong enough faith. I wouldn't be able to speak about God to someone. I'd be embarrassed. I'm unworthy. I'd be ineffective. I'm weak. And you know what? When the devil hears that, he thinks, oh, yes, this is great. Because he wants to kill our willingness to witness. He basically wants to destroy our lives. The devil will do anything to make our lives a living hell. And he very often tells us that we're not good enough. We're just ordinary. Aye. It's often easy for him to do this because we often let him do it. Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, Jesus' words, he says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose the easy way. But the gateway to life is small. The road is narrow. And only a few people will find that. Peter tells us the enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And he says to us, take the easy way. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, Satan, the god of this evil world, ha evil world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news that is shining upon them. That's Satan's goal. He wants you to feel at best ordinary and at worst worthless. But we don't have to be. We don't have to feel ordinary. We don't have to be ordinary. Is there such a thing as an ordinary Christian? What do you think? The Bible tells me that whenever I come to faith in Jesus, it's a living faith, I become a new creation. When I come to faith in Jesus, he enables me to, to do extraordinary things, 
because he gives me the power to do it. Not because I can do it, but because he gives me the power to do it. Robert read earlier on a wonderful story, and I hadn't really focused in on this story too much before, if I'm honest. It's the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer. That's the first reading that Robert read for us. Now, most armor bearers back then were were young guys, probably in their teens. And their job was to do exactly what it says in the tin, as someone once said. They were to bear the armor, to carry the armor for the soldier. They were to assist him when he was when needed. Now, without telling anyone one day, Jonathan gets this prompting to go on and do battle with a Philistine outpost. The Philistines had a massive army. And Jonathan thought, I'm going to go myself, just attack this outpost. But, of course, I'll need to take my armor bearer with me. So he decides to take him along. So to cut a long story short, he wants his right-hand man to come along and assist him in fighting against these massive soldiers. Now, these soldiers, particular soldiers, were most likely very ruthless. Um, And it wouldn't have phased them to kill women, to kill children. It wouldn't have faced him to, to take as prisoners their enemy and turn them into slaves. They were ruthless. They were strong. They were barbaric. They were men who you didn't want to mess with. But Jonathan was prompted by God to take them on, but not on his own. He took his armor bearer with him. And First Samuel 14 verse 7 says that the armor bearer said, Do all that you have in mind. Go ahead. I'm with you, heart and soul. I'm right behind you, in other words. I'll rephrase that. I'm with you. I'll supply what you need. I'll support you in this battle. That's what the young armor bearer said. So Jonathan and this young armor bearer, they climb up, they they go and they attack this Philistine outpost. And we know the story. Um, they, they attack and kill some 20 men in an area uh, around about the size of an acre. And they cause panic right throughout the Philistine army. And we're told that later on, um, many of the Philistines were so terrified that they fled. Now, the thing I love about this story isn't the fact that they they won a battle battle and they, they scattered the Philistine army. It's that this young, ordinary armor bearer did an amazing thing. It's a great story because you'd have thought that this young teenager would have been terrified, scared half to death. You'd have thought he would have been thinking to himself, Jonathan, are you mad? You and me going to take on these Philistines. But there was no sign of fear. He said, I'm right behind you. I'll be with you. He was obedient to Jonathan's request. You know, I do believe each one of us can do extraordinary things. We don't have to just be ordinary Christians if there is such a thing. Because God says... I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope, plans to give you a future. God has plans to move you and me away from an ordinary Christian life to an extraordinary Christian life. And there's some things that we need to do to make this happen. God has it for us. He has what we need. And all we have to do is reach for it. So here's a few things that I believe that we need to do if we want to move from ordinary to extraordinary. One, obvious one, put God first. And that's a choice and it's also an action required of us. We must make a choice to put God first. First and foremost in everything in our lives. First and foremost, in our wishes, first and foremost, in our desires, from we get up till we go back to bed, putting God first. 
if we have difficult decisions to make. Don't trust in our, 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 our own knowledge. Bring it before God in prayer. Include him in it. Put him first. In Ephesians 3, uh, 19 and 20, the second passage that Robert read for us, a slightly different version here, but you'll get the gist. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it is so great, you will never fully understand it. Then you will be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. In other words, if you want to do something extraordinary, God will provide it for you. And then he says, now, glory be to God. By his power at work within us, he is able to accomplish infinitely more than we can either dare to ask or think. You see, the difference between ordinary, being ordinary and being extraordinary is, first of all, putting that trust completely in God. And he will be able to accomplish mighty things. That's what Paul writes to the Ephesians. Accomplish mighty things, extraordinary things through us. But we need to believe it and we need to claim it. There's no room in the Christian journey for a woe is me type attitude towards being a Christian. We have the Lord of heaven's armies behind us. And he's given us a wonderful armor bearer. I'm going to talk about that armor bearer very shortly. But often our attitude can be, I'm a Christian, so therefore I need to be sad and, and live a, a very mundane, dreary state of life, sort of life. Burdened by my struggles, burdened with sin that I can never conquer, feeling I'm not good enough. Here's what Paul says. Greater is the power within you. And then he prays for us. He says that, How I wish and pray that you would know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. I want to be filled with the fullness of God today. I hope you do too. God has, has called us to live lives of prosperity, of joy, of happiness, of love, of patience, and of strength. And prosperity here doesn't mean prosperity from a worldly perspective. If you become a Christian, it doesn't mean you're going to automatically become a millionaire and have loads of cash at hand. Prosperity in the Christian life is all about growing in spiritual richness. Overflowing, not necessarily with cash, but with the spiritual gifts that Paul talks about in many of his letters, especially in Galatians. God has some wonderful things in store for us, but are we prepared to claim those things? Are we prepared to be willing to give this concept of, of living an extraordinary life a chance? We've got to claim that extraordinary life. But we can't live that extraordinary life without this last thing. We need the enablement of the Holy Spirit. The Bible calls the Holy Spirit the helper. Why would he be called the helper if we didn't need his help? And it's important for us to open up our lives to receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We need wisdom, we need knowledge, we need faith, we need healing. We need to be workers of miracles. We need to be able to prophesy. We need to be able to discern between spirits. We need the gift of tongues, if that's what God wants to give us. We need the interpretation of tongues, if that's what God wants to give us. And it doesn't stop there, because Paul talks of other gifts elsewhere in his, his letters. In Romans 12, he talks about the gift of serving, the gift of teaching, the gift of encouragement, the gift of generosity and giving, the gift of leadership, the, the gift of being merciful, and of course, the gift of faith and forgiveness.
But more than this, he's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit to assist us, to be our armor bearer. Like an armor bearer is used, was used to support uh, Jonathan in his battle, we need an armor bearer with us if we're going to stand up against the foe. We talked about right at the start of this address, the evil one who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy us. We need the Holy Spirit as our armor bearer. The one who's going to say to us, I'm with you. I'm right behind you here. In chapter 6 of Ephesians, I'm sure you, you know uh, the letter to the Ephesians, Paul talks about uh, putting on the full armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, taking up the sword of the Spirit, putting on the shoes of readiness for the gospel, taking up your shield of faith, etc. But who is it that provides us and carries that armor for us? Is it not the Holy Spirit of God who lives in us, who's the one who's right behind us, behind us? Jonathan's armor bearer was there and he wasn't going to let him down. And our armor bearer, the Holy Spirit, won't let us down either. He'll fight for us. He'll provide what we need in this battle against Satan and sin. The song or the hymn says, put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. And I imagine in that hymn, I just get this picture in my mind of, of us standing there waiting to be armed. And who is it that hands us our armor? The Holy Spirit of God. Here's your belt, put it on. Buckle it tight. Here's your breastplate. Here's your helmet. Here's your shield. Here's your sword. Here's your shoes. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. But I wonder today for you, do you have the armor bearer in your life? Is the Holy Spirit real to you? Is the Holy Spirit working in and through you and speaking to you and supporting you and giving you the armor that you need to fight this battle against Satan? You see, without the armor bearer, I'm pretty sure Jonathan could not have achieved what he achieved. He couldn't have won that battle. Without the Holy Spirit fully equipping us and utilizing the gifts that God wants to give us, then we're going to struggle. But through God's Spirit, through this Holy Spirit that God gives us, God offers us the armor so that we can obtain the victory over the enemy, over our own fears as well, over our doubts, over our weakness, over our embarrassment, over our negative thoughts, etc. And there's an endless supply of help available to you and me. And the Holy Spirit wants to give all those good things to you and to me. Because he doesn't want us just to be ordinary Christians. He wants us to be extraordinary. I wonder, do you believe that today? Don't believe it simply because I say to you, oh, it's a good idea to believe that today. Believe it because God's Word says it. Acts chapter 2 uh, and verse 17. In the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, on your sons and your daughters, and they shall prophesy. And your young men will see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. The Holy Spirit's there and real and willing to equip us to live extraordinary lives. Grasp it. Ask the Lord to pour His Spirit upon you. Ask the Lord to give you everything that you need and more to, to be able to accomplish what he has for you to do. I want to close by just reading again verse 20 of Ephesians chapter 3 that Robert has read for us. 
because it quite simply says this, Now to him who by the power at work within us, that's the Holy Spirit, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be the glory. So no more ordinary. Let's grasp the extraordinary. Let me pray for you today. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for your word, your word that makes us wise unto salvation and so much more. Thank you, Lord, that you have provided for us your Holy Spirit, the helper, the comforter, the advocate. And Lord, thank you that through your Holy Spirit, you're willing to, willing to give us the armor that we need to step outside this little box called ordinary into an extraordinary existence and life for you, guided by you and given the rules to perform for your praise and for your glory. So Lord, help us today. Help us to be ready to live extraordinary lives as we seek to serve you better. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.